So welcome everyone to our Regional Horizons briefing. I'm really glad to see you all here. I see some familiar faces. Thanks again. It's um, delightful to have you here. Um, before um, we kick off, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the First Nations people who are the traditional owners of the land on which we are all standing or sitting at the moment and um, acknowledge uh, the uh, traditional owners of the land uh, who are present, um, uh, who are um, current and are future owners of the land. And it's particularly important that we acknowledge them, I think, at this time when we are seeing uh, so much um, so much of the voice of uh, uh, Indigenous people around the country um, and around the globe. Um, I've uh, just let people know about questions that may be arising via Slido. Just like to remind you all again that the link is in the chat box and we'd love to hear your questions a bit later. So um, without further ado, I just wanted to introduce Regional Horizons to you all. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a program we're incredibly proud of at Farmers for Climate Action and we're thrilled to be able to share with you today the details. I think like all individuals and organisations passionate about rural and regional Australia, farming communities, the agricultural industry as the iconic Australian industry that feeds and clothes us, and the climate movement. Farmers for Climate Action knows uh, that this is our sliding doors moment. We're really excited to launch Regional Horizons, which is FCA's vision for farming communities leading a recovery beyond COVID-19 and towards clean energy and low carbon future where resilient rural and regional communities are leading the way to a sustainable and world leading agricultural industry. We're incredibly proud of Regional Horizons, which has been the focus of FCA these past few weeks, uh, months, and it's a program we've all contributed to and are champions for. It's been spearheaded by Verity Morgan Schmidt and Cam Close at FCA and drafted in consultation with some of Australia's most eminent agricultural leaders, climate experts, and political and economic brains that have contributed significantly. Um, I'd like to acknowledge to the farmers' voices and experiences that have been brought to life in this document and really do um, articulate beautifully the, the need for the regional horizon program and the opportunities it presents. Um, and in particular, one of the team, Peter Holding, has been really key to much of the detail about what farming communities need and can contribute right now and into the future. Um, forgive the um, slightly weather-related um, cliche, but really now is the perfect storm for us. We have the public's attention, we have the opportunity, we have the appetite and the demand for cli tackling climate uh, and the need to recover and seek stimulus to do that. Farmers have the will and the solutions and uh, an engaged and skilled part of the country which is ready to step up now. But what we really need now to complete this is the political will and the leadership from our politicians to make it a reality. Uh, today you'll hear from Verity as she takes us through the detail of the program and we'll be answering your questions about how uh, Regional Horizons works and aims to achieve um, and drives outcomes for rural and regional Australia. And Cam will uh, join us as well to talk about what's next. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to um, extend a huge welcome and thanks to Helen Haynes, the member for Indi, who is a wonderful supporter and friend of farming communities in rural and regional Australia. Helen is the independent member for Indi. She has a farm just out of Wangaratta and has been supportive of farmers taking climate action uh, since being elected to Parliament. Um, thank you so much for your time, Helen. Uh, over to you. Wendy, we just need to unmute Helen. Okay, Claire, can you, are you able to do that? Yes, I have asked, yep. I'm unmuted now, all good? Okay, thank you so much, Wendy. Thank, and. Um, Thank you so much to Farmers for Climate Action for this um, really lovely invitation uh, to be part of the launch today of the Regional uh, Horizons um, uh, recommendations and report. 
I'm a, I'm a little bit breathless actually. I've just run up the back stairs and I raced Andrew Lee. He didn't know he was he was racing with me, but um, just to try and get here in time. Um, but uh, I, I have I have regained my breath now. So if, if I sound sound like I'm excited, I am. Uh, I am about this report because it's really. I think it's, it's strategic and it's time to do, um, but we've been in such an extraordinary situation, which has been uh, stated by so many people so many times, but extraordinary situations give us an opportunity, really. Uh, they give us an opportunity to paint a new future for ourselves, if that's what we choose to do, or indeed it locks us into a sense of powerlessness. It locks us into a future that other people people write for us and, and I think the events of the last six months started with the, uh, the summer which are natural uh, on our farming farming environment um, on our very way of seeing ourselves uh, as a as a nation that holidayed on the coast as a nation that uh, that loved exploring the bush and seeing the, the extraordinary ecological diversity that our bushland held, um, to have a sense of fear all summer that so much of this was lost to us, heightened, I think, heightened our sensitivity to what was going on in the climate. Of course, uh, what followed that uh, was, uh, was and is the COVID-19 pandemic, and that's changed things yet again. Uh, the shutdown of our economy as a result of uh, social distancing guidelines and the response to the health emergency that faced us meant that not only are we now looking at, uh, at environmental changes, but also economic changes. So again, there's always two choices, isn't there? Um, to let that wash over us, to feel powerless, to take whatever is dished up by a government um, to let others be the voices in a space that dictate what the future looks like or how we might respond to it, or indeed to, um, in agricultural terms, take the bull by the horns and paint a, a future that we want to see. So um, I was really delighted uh, when I read, read your work and, um, and it painted a future. And in fact, the, the two scenarios that, uh, that you describe on, on, uh, on the two possible futures, I think it is... For me, the best part of the report, and uh, because it really does lay out for us how things could be if we chose to take a particular direction. Um, we know that we have a government who is, who is uh, talking about uh, the potential for agriculture. Um, we know that we have a government that is uh, talking about new uh, technologies uh, for energy in this nation. Um, how that's brought about is, is the key part here. And, and again, painting a scenario where we can choose something I think is really important. So the National Climate Change and Agriculture Work Plan is one that I would like to see interested citizens right across the nation writing to their MPs about. I had the great privilege uh, when I first came to parliament um, to launch, uh, launch your earlier report and to then move a motion in the House around uh, calling on the government to have a climate change and agriculture plan. We don't have one federally still, um, but we can continue to call for it. And I, and I really urge people, um, not, just, not just those listening here today, but those listening here today to go out and talk to their friends and, and citizens across the nation to write to their MPs, to call on the government, uh, to look at work such as this and paint a future that can, uh, can be a bright one for agriculture in Australia. Um, I want to touch just briefly on uh, regional energy transition. And um, I think the opportunities that you have painted for us before and again uh, today in this document about the potential for agriculture to diversify its income streams uh, through, through energy transition programs, uh, the capacity to, to generate energy on, on farmland through, uh, whether it be through solar, whether it be through wind or hydro, I think is an opportunity that hasn't been realised by so many in the agricultural community yet, and, and the opportunity is there. Um, 
in saying that, I, I'd like to highlight to anyone who's listening um, that there is a, 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 an effort to do this um, coming from my electorate of Indi, uh, whereby we are speaking to people all over the nation. We have a, uh, a 15, 15 member expert panel of uh, local community energy experts who are working with me in my office uh, on a co-design approach to policy around uh, community energy. I'd, I'd like to ask people to, to have a look at that. We have a discussion paper. We'd love a submission from, uh, from Australians, wherever you may be. Uh, and within that, there's an opportunity for people in rural and regional Australia to really harness the opportunities that this period of crisis brings to us, uh, to, to jump on board really what, with what is, uh, I think, one of the greatest opportunities to, to grow jobs, to grow opportunities and to grow wealth in regional Australia uh, through, through robust community energy programs and uh, to democratise energy through buy-in from local people whereby they can share the opportunities and wealth and, and generate jobs in regional Australia. So I invite you to do that as well. Um, I think the fact that we are in a situation whereby we've stated very clearly uh, and the National Farmers Federation states very clearly um, that we can grow agriculture from $60 billion to $100 billion industry by 2030 um, is uh, a very ambitious claim. Uh, and of course, we can't do that unless we really take into account um, the very real, the very real uh, issues that we face with an unstable climate uh, and with increased temperatures and with what we know are going to be uh, more and more frequent extreme weather events. So again, this, this document puts to decision makers a, a way forward that I think is practical and that we can certainly um, embrace if we so choose to. I, um, I think it's also fair to say that right now, um, the voices that we're hearing in the federal government uh, are coming from from the government initiated NCCC. And uh, I think we need to be very mindful that the voices of, of groups such as Farmers for Climate Action need to be equally loud. And so I'm here really to advocate uh, for what you put forward to us in the federal, federal parliament. I'll be speaking to my parliamentary colleagues about this and sharing this document. And uh, I commit to having a conversation also um, with the Federal Minister for Agriculture. Uh, I know you will be as well, but I will add my voice to that too. I'm deeply committed to a future for Australian agriculture that uh, is one that we can all embrace, is one that brings a brighter future for us, is one that's cognizant of the challenges of climate action, but is one that harnesses the opportunity for us all to gain and to position regional Australia as a powerhouse of energy production, as a powerhouse of sustainable agriculture. So thank you again. And uh, I'll pass on now, I think, to Verity, who's going to walk us, walk us through the document. Thank you, Helen. Verity's just unmuting herself. Um, thank you so much, Helen, for those um, wonderful wor words and, and, and wonderful insights as well. Uh, um, before uh, Verity starts to take us through the detail, I just uh, also wanted to acknowledge um, the, the team members and the board members of FCA that have joined us today as well and thank them again for their support and their um, incredible work in this document. Um, none other than Verity who has, uh, as I say, has really spearheaded um, this, this program. So over to you Verity and um, thanks everyone and thanks again Helen. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. And thanks, Wendy. Um, great to hear from you, Helen. Appreciate your efforts in Parliament. It's wonderful. So I'll just quickly, before I start, acknowledge the owners of the, the traditional owners of the country that I live and farm on, the Gubby Gubby people. And I think that the reason that it's important for me to do that is that, frankly, I'm drawing upon that Indigenous knowledge of this landscape because it's not my own space. It's a place that's quite new to me. So it's certainly when I was framing this document and our 2030 horizons, I was looking back into the past as well and reflecting on the wisdom that can be gained 
The other point that I just wanted to, to draw to everyone's attention is the phenomenally diverse backgrounds that are actually sitting on this call today, the diverse backgrounds and the professional interests. So regional horizons, the way that I'm seeing it from where I sit right now, is that in some ways it's already brought people together. We talk a lot in agriculture about the rural urban divide. You know, we lament the findings from PF about the growing disconnect. And yet on this call, I'm just having a look at some of the faces. On this call, I see extraordinary people from agriculture, and I'm gonna call a couple of you out in a second, but I also see people who sit at the opposite end of the agri-food supply chain. And I think what this has done on this call, we're on the same page, or at least loosely on the same page. We're acknowledging that, that agricultural productivity and landscape health, that's essential for our, our mutual prosperity moving forward, regardless of whether you sit in a, a rural or an urban area. Um, so just quickly to, to acknowledge a couple of the people whose work really contributed to this report, even if they don't quite know it. Um, in particular, Dr. Alex Ball from UNE is on the call. Alex, I don't know if you want to give a wave. Um, Alex was one of the expert review panelists um, who assisted, assisted us with this work, as was Dr. Lauren Rickards, who I know was planning on attending, but I don't know if I've seen her yet. The other person who I'd like to acknowledge whose um, work this certainly built upon was Katie McRobert from Australian Farm Institute, who I know is with us today. So I'll touch on AFI's report in a moment as well. And lastly, uh, the expertise of Dr. Tom Davison has been invaluable in, in multiple scenarios in terms of informing our own internal understanding, even though he wasn't directly involved in this report. So before I go any further, I'll just place this discussion paper within the agricultural um, landscape because we know that we see countless reports coming through and I was delighted to hear Helen's reflections that it's the two scenarios that um, were most compelling for her because this is something that I personally waged an internal war over. It's not something you typically see in an academic paper and yet we were hoping it would achieve that cut through and that engagement and I'm so pleased to hear Helen's comments that it has. So as associate members for National Farmers Federation, um, this proposal is aligned with their $100 billion 2030 vision. And you'll note that there is reference to that um, within the paper. It also builds upon the work, the change in the air report that was prepared by last year by the Australian Farm Institute, which we were delighted to launch at Parliament House. And I'll just again acknowledge the work of Richard Heath and Katie and team on that seminal report. Um, the paper also draws upon work by the Climate Change Authority, so the Prospering in a Low Emissions World um, Policy Toolkit, which came out in March this year, and that raised initiatives from a broad array of organisations, the Red Meat Advisory Council, a Council, National Farmers Federation, and a host of others. So the point that I would make there is that this, this report, this discussion paper, these proposals are not radical and they're not particularly new. In fact, it's actually pulling together the streams of work that so many fantastic brains have actually invested in over the time. Now, there will definitely be people on this call who are far better placed than me to deep dive into the potential implementation of some of the programs that are here, the scale of the funding and the interface between those initiatives and others. And we absolutely welcome that feedback, that insight, your expertise to help us inform the next steps for this program. FCA is a still a relatively small not-for-profit and we set ourselves a fairly audacious task of identifying some of those essential ingredients for a productive and sustainable regional Australia when we look ahead to 2030. And for those who provided their expertise, for those who had input and for those who have done work before, um, before us that we've been able to build upon, we are incredibly grateful. So after all that lengthy preamble, I'll get to the actual content of the report. So to our way of thinking, if we're looking ahead to 2030, we know that we've already locked a certain degree of warming into our system. We know that the decisions that we make today are going to influence our climate trajectory out from 2030, but up into that point, historic emissions are going to be one of the major drivers. What is up to us, however, is how we adapt and how we set a different course for the future. To our way of thinking, there are four core pillars of that. The first that I'll touch upon 
is the National Climate Change and Agriculture Work Program. Now, most of you will be relatively familiar with this. It's work that um, ASIL Allen did extensive consultation around through 2018, 2019. Uh, Ag Victoria has been doing some work on it. Australian Farm Institute did a fantastic report with us outlining uh, the reasons that we needed to be the ingredients that come together. And yet we sit here in 2020 and I still find myself somewhat incredulous that we're in 2020. Climate change has cost Australian agriculture roughly a billion dollars according to ABES over the last 20 years. And yet we still don't have a program, a comprehensive program that has been implemented. So the reason for the inclusion of that program in this document is to really keep things moving, to ensure that in the post COVID recovery, we don't see those essential ingredients slip off the radar in any way. Can you all hear me okay? Just Claire, can you do a sound check for me? Yes, I can. Perfectly. Perfect. Okay, thank you everyone. It'd be a shame to get to the end. Okay, so from our way of thinking, there's a few essential ingredients that need to, to fit within this climate change and agriculture work program and also um, really start to flesh it out a little bit more. So rather than purely a high level rhetoric, we're actually able to see some tangible, meaningful results for farmers on the ground. The first of those is the National Primary Industries Climate Research Development and Adoption Program. And I am so, so delighted to see some of the work that Minister Littleproud has been encouraging the Council of RDCs and others to start uh, working on of late. I had a, a short briefing on that with the Farming Systems Committee at NFF on Friday. And to be honest, it was so, I was quite ecstatic to see that work starting to come through. So putting some additional resourcing behind that so that those programs can really deliver the results for farmers on the ground so that our research and innovation enables us to keep pace or better yet grow in spite of the increasing challenges that we are facing. The second ingredient of that climate change and agriculture work program to our way of thinking is actually building the capacity of farmers and allied businesses. So whether that is your agronomist, whether that is your rural bank manager, the agri-food supply chain to actually be able to engage with these exciting concepts, particularly around carbon neutrality and carbon farming. Now we've had iterations of programs like this in the past. We've had things like the Carbon Farming Extension and Outreach Program, which was limited in a sense that it wasn't really able to talk too much about climate, it was on the carbon farming, but actually expanding those initiatives to be able to facilitate improved capacity across rural Australia to take advantage and seize those clean green opportunities that we tend to talk a lot about in our marketing literature. Now, there is already some absolutely fantastic work underway and I don't know whether or anyone from that working group is on the call. I know a few had registered um, tests from Beef Sustainability Framework and a few others. There's work underway with the Primary Industries Climate Challenges Centre, the University of Melbourne, CRISPY, um, CRISPY MLA, are all around the table on exploring a, a leadership program very similar to this one. What it doesn't have behind it yet is actually the resourcing to turn it into implementation. There's a lot of goodwill, there's incredible brains pulling this together. Where this pro, uh, proposal steps in is to actually advocate for the resourcing. So that does become a central priority. The third component of this is going back to, to the Climate Smart Agricultural Extension. And this is something that in my three years at Farmers for Climate Action has genuinely astonished me, is the number of farmers, primary producers right across Australia, who are coming to FCA and seeking that extension because they're not uh, necessarily feeling like they're getting the information around climate smart agriculture elsewhere. Now we do have brilliant work that has been done by the RDCs in particular and I would certainly see that this is a space for um, increased collaboration and support and resourcing to be able to get that information out to farmers to facilitate not only the incremental adaptation, which is really where agriculture has been pretty exceptional over recent years, but also that more systematic, but also transformational adaptation, which sometimes unfortunately slips through the gaps. And again, you know, it's just been absolutely amazing to see the legislation for the Future Drought Fund, for example, the, the latest version that is before the parliament actually starts to incorporate that language around transformative adaptation. So the way that I would view it is that these doors are increasingly opening. There is more space for industry to be able to really be getting their teeth into those outcomes that we desperately need. 
The second, I do feel like I'm going to be talking to you at you for a long time and I do apologize for that. Um, the second ingredient that we see as being relatively essential, and there's a lot of different names for this, we've called it a land and environment investment fund and it is by far the largest component of the um, of the, the package that we've put forward here. However, there is deep alignment with some of the other work that is being explored. And I particularly point to the work that NFF has been doing. There's been a great announcement with an ANU partnership recently. The Land and Environment Investment Fund concept actually comes from the Climate Change Authority and contributions that were made by RMAC, amongst a few others, um, into exploring, well, how do we reward, oh dear, sorry call coming in, terrible thing with Zoom. How do we actually reward farmers and land custodians in a way that enables them to support, protect natural capital, but also leverage private investment coming into the sector. Now, this would obviously be predicated on significant collaboration. It could be built. Um, this is one of the, the recommendations that has come through from the Climate Change Authority as well, is to expedite that process of facilitating access to that funding, built using the Clean Energy Finance Corporation model in a way that allows things to move a little bit more quickly than starting from scratch the huge amount of collaboration required with the rural research and development corporations the universities the crcs and all of those others that are coming into the space much along the same lines as what the clean energy finance corporation and arena already do so expanding those loan and investment opportunities expanding those financial incentives I'm going to quickly race through the last two so that we don't lose you and you can all jump into questions. Um, the third ingredient is actually that soft social infrastructure, which, you know, we, we kind of often forget. It's not the sexy stuff. It's not, a, it's not a new research project that you can really point to. And yet when we have bushfires, when we have COVID, it's actually that soft social infrastructure. It's those learning networks. It's how do we communicate with each other? Where do we source that information from? And how do we accelerate our growth through that space that become incredibly important? So this is where for us, the Regional Resilience Hub Network becomes incredibly important. So that needs to be underpinned by digital architecture, a first class digital art architecture. And we've got some existing resources and I hope everyone's filled in the survey around the Climate Change in Australia website. If you haven't please do so but expanding that resource expanding the community of practice into re resilience research but also expanding those knowledge hubs for farmers to be able to look to climate or analogs to connect with farmers in different regions for communities to not only be able to look over the fence but to look more broadly across Australia and across the world to really create those deep connections so that we can start exploring what does resilience look like into the future and there is brilliant examples of where this has happened in Australia and I know Chris Saunas um, formerly with BCG is on the call and that's one of the examples that I would point to of where those resilience hubs, those knowledge networks have worked incredibly well. Clendinen Group um, formerly was another one as well. Putting resources into that space, valuing our social capital across rural and regional Australia. And finally, and this one I know for a few people is a little bit jarring, and yet as work by um, the Australian Farm Institute and, and Helen Haynes's office and many others has shown, there's significant opportunities arising from the clean energy transition for rural and regional communities. Now, at its, um, at its absolute heart, this question for us is about how do rural communities take advantage? How do they see the benefits of this rather than being the recipients of perhaps a solar farm where it is unwanted? How do we actually create a frame where it is led by rural and regional Australia taking ownership of these programs? So the first component of that for us is actually around those communities who are in need of transition support as we move to a decarbonised or low carbon economy. And there's a few areas that we've highlighted there where frankly, clean energy will play a role, but so will sustainable intensification of agriculture and value adding for agriculture in those regions. There's also the huge opportunities that come for communities through community owned energy. And I think Helen's office would point to the Yak and Dander example. And finally, and this is something where the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and NFF have already done some good, great work, is growing agriculture through clean energy. And there's examples in our report of case studies where farmers have really been able to seize the advantages that clean energy offers them to diversify their operations, to reduce their costs and to create a more resilient business model. So that 
in a nutshell is our report. And like I said at the start, it is, it is put into the space to really continue to spark conversation, to ask the question of where do we want to be in 2030? How are we going to take the steps necessary today to enable us to get to that end point? So I'll throw back to Wendy. I think I've talked at you for long enough. I'm hoping this will be the start of a really good discussion across our multiple industry partners and all of the stakeholders that are involved on this call. And just a, a thank you again for taking the time to join us for being interested enough in the program. Thank you so much, Verity. <clears throat> Amazing to provide such incredible coverage uh, of um, Regional Horizons in, you know, before time. I think you had uh, three minutes to spare. <laughs> but that, that's great because it provides us more opportunity to um, have uh, some Q&As and some really great discussions. Um, I, I would also like to invite people to uh, visit um, our brand new website at farmersforclimateaction.org.au where Regional Horizons in great detail is the feature of our newly branded, brand, uh, fresh and exciting new website. So um, after this call, we'd love for you to go and visit that and to, to uh, get, in the, uh, get your, um, uh, your teeth more into the detail of the, of the um, program itself. Uh, but we do have a couple of questions now. Um, the first being from Katie, thank you for that. Um, for Verity and Cam, where does Crispy fit into the R&D work plan? Verity, I'm sure you'll have some thoughts on that. I might throw that back to Katie. When are we seeing a review of um, uh, Crispy being made public? Um, look, I think one of the key things here is actually to look at our existing structures and certainly not throw them out the door, not for a second, but actually look at them in much the same way that Crispy has been going through a review and go, how do we make this better? How do we build upon what is already there and either give those vehicles some more teeth to be able to pull things together if they are the appropriate vehicle to do so? And Katie, that's a conversation I'd love to have with you. Um, if they are the appropriate vehicles to do so, give them those teeth so that really we can facilitate uh, that research and innovation and adoption in a way that doesn't have people slipping through the gaps when they need to increasingly move to that transformative adaptation. I know how difficult that space is in the, the RDC. I know none of this is simple and I wouldn't pretend otherwise. But I think that's, that's the important point of kick-starting this conversation and making sure that we've got a broad array of stakeholders so it's not just agriculture and the RDCs having the conversation with themselves. It's a far broader array bringing it together and really interrogating what do we value and where does our um, research and innovation and structures like CRISPY actually sit in delivering that. You're on mute, Wendy. Sorry, sorry. Thank you for that. Very thank you, Jack, for reminding me. Um, that uh, trust her uh, answers your question, Katie, but uh, probably also throws up some more opportunities to keep talking. Um, uh, Jacob has a question. Does this proposal align with the Pew Charitable Trust proposal for an economic stimulus measure for conservation and land management? Again, Verity, I know you will uh, have um, uh, excellent um, coverage of this question. Jacob, thanks for such a great question. And I would say yes and no. So yes, in the sense that this aligns with the, the Pew and NFF and National Land Care Network and all of the other wonderful stakeholders that have been involved in that proposal. And we absolutely support what they're doing with that. I would argue this goes further though. And that's where the things like the regional energy transition program, for example, um, the inclusion of that regional resilience hub network, that goes beyond the, the conversation and that stimulus proposal that a Pew has, a Pew and other partners have put forward. Um, slightly different focus, but absolutely support the, the initiative that they're working on as well. Do you mind if I follow up on that, Verity, um, and just ask, that, and I'm not sure about this at all, and I'm just um, thinking as I, as I go here, there seems to be, like we have the NFF um, current project around biodiversity stewardship. Um, we've seen the Pew Charitable Trust come out with requesting $4 billion. Um, and now Farmers for Climate Action has come out with this one. Um, is there a concern that there's 
too many going for the same bucket of money, even though that there is no current bucket of money that's been um, associated for, for this? It's such a great question. And it's certainly one that I've tossed up as well. And there's others, Jacob, that you, that you haven't mentioned that are um, still bubbling away with other organisations and other alliances in the space. Yeah. And, you know, I think the point that I would make is that there needs to be a forum where the, these players who are pushing for these objectives really come around the table because there are so many synergies across the various areas and I cannot speak for the other organisations but I think from our perspective to us it's actually about how do you start delivering these outcomes these funding on the ground if you're achieving very very similar outcomes and you're calling it the biodiversity stewardship package then that's okay FCA is not going to lose sleep about whether it goes with the Land and Environment Investment Fund label or whether it has a label change somewhere along the lines. The important thing is that we're actually able to go, well, what are the essential ingredients for unlocking that natural capital, maintaining that biodiversity, the ecosystem services, et cetera? What are the essential ingredients and how do we bring those players into the room to be able to achieve that when we are... Um, I guess we get, having the conversation with government but also highlighting to government that it is a really really important area so i think there's sort of multiple ways that you could look at it thanks verity jacob um thanks for those questions uh i think um that uh is, is yet another indication of how um i'd like to open up um the the doors and i'll, I'll put my uh, e email address in into the chat but um, going forward, we'd love to continue chatting with um, the very many representatives of industry that have joined us today for this call and see ways of, of um, you know, providing more of a unified um, and integrated front for, as you say, tapping into a limited pool of funds that is going to serve very similar um, projects and uh, overall elevate um, uh, opportunities and um, the future for rural and regional Australia. Do we have any more questions from anybody coming in? Have we got, to, I'll go back to Slido. Here we go. There's Katie again. Thank you, Katie. Uh, is there appetite from the government to incorporate some of these ideas under the Ag Stewardship Package? I don't know yet, Katie. Um, is the honest answer. I'd love, love to say yes, that they could be incorporated under the Ag Stewardship Package. I do wonder whether you would actually lose some of the focus on them. But I think the other point that I would note is that there are initiatives sitting within government where resources, so I'm thinking in particular of the Future Drought Fund, there is potential that there could be alignment um, with some of the objectives that that is working on. I'd take your advice on that as well, Katie, as to whether there is um, interest from the government in funding this sort of broader focus around ag stewardship, but I couldn't comment in too much detail on that at this point in time. I think we're at the very beginnings of this conversation with them. Great, let's keep talking. Um, now, I'm still not on mute, which is good. Um, wonderful, thank you. Any further questions or comments um, that anyone would like to offer or throw into the mix? Um, we've got some extraordinary experience on, and, and no doubt um, viewpoints and ideas on this call. We would love to hear them, encourage um, conversations not only here but going into the future. Um, I think we are, here we go, an anonymous person has asked how do we best integrate trees into productive landscapes and deliver carbon sequestration at scale? So that's from me, Hugh Wareham at Greening Australia. I didn't mean to be anonymous. No, that's okay Hugh, <laughs> thank you very much for putting your hand up. Great question. Um, Verity, over to you again. Sure. You know, Hugh, when, um, when that question was read out, you were the first suspect in my mind. <laughs> so you almost didn't need to dob yourself in. <laughs> it's a great question, Hugh. And, you know, I think the work that Greening has done in particular is a really good example of how those things can start to be rolled out. When it comes to implementing that at scale, I think, you know, 
It depends on whether we're talking about um, climate solutions fund, emissions reduction fund style implementation of those measures, in which case we need to open the door and make it a lot simpler. And I'm sure most of you on the call have probably been involved in submissions to either the, um, to, uh, the Climate Change Authority Emissions Reduction Fund review that closed recently or have been very closely looking at the recommendations of the King review. So I think there's certainly that facilitation through the policy angle of actually being able to reward and recognise funds farmers for implementing trees in the landscape for those carbon benefits at scale. I think, and you and I have had this conversation offline as well, Hugh, um, there's also a, a value proposition that needs to be pulled in here of making the economics of it work. And it is much harder, of course, to actually uh, make the numbers work around planting trees in the landscape versus you know avoided deforestation or human induced regeneration or savanna burning or some of the other project types so there is i believe there's a whole other body of work that doesn't necessarily fit within the scope of this but actually needs to um, really be explored in relation to how do we increase accessibility around that um, the climate solutions fund how do we bring that value up and whether that is private markets etc i think is probably slightly outside the scope of this work but as you know it's it's an area that's hugely important thanks verity hugh i'm, I'm sure you'll be uh, happy with that response um, we have another question from brad um, this could be a very um, uh, a very uh, detailed response no doubt um, we have another seven minutes so i'm sure we can get through this and perhaps one more question after that but brad asks can i ask a question about alignment of all of these initiatives and ideas and links to non-traditional market and if or whether such support for non-product attributes may be seen by competitors overseas as subsidising agriculture? It's a big question. <laughs> it is a great question. Um, you know, my immediate response is to say that uh, as when you look at OECD nations, Australian agriculture is one of the, the least subsidised in the world. Um, and we're pretty proud of that, as you would be very well aware, Brad. Um, could it be seen that way? You know, I don't believe so. I think if you look at the international context, you look at some of the challenges that are unfolding around, you know, European um, border carbon, EU border carbon adjustments, etc. I don't believe so, but I think when it comes to trade negotiation, if you've got someone who is trying to push back on you for a political reason or for any other advantage, much as we've seen in Bali recently, they're going to try to manipulate um, you know, multiple examples that may not necessarily uh, be reflected in fact. So my immediate response, Brad, would be I don't believe so, but I'd be very, very happy to actually talk to someone who has far more expertise in international trade uh, than what I do. Great. Katie, I think you've got a good point. <laughs> We'd still be right down the bottom of the OECD list. Thanks, Verity. Thanks, Brad. Uh, Peter Thompson, I think we have time for maybe, depending on how how quickly we can get through this, um, we might have time for this and maybe one more question. But Peter Thompson asks, how do we ensure that farmers who have already made major changes, often many years ago, eligible for funding, um, reward rather than new improvements are given they may only be able to make incremental change today? Pete, it's a cracking question and it comes up so often, um, whether it's people like you who have really led the way in land stewardship or whether it's, you know, sugarcane producers who have been doing some pretty awesome work with carbon in their landscapes. This conversation around additionality is so incredibly challenging. I don't know that I have a necessarily perfect answer, but I think one of the, the things that jumps to mind to me immediately and is potentially the space that the Land and Environment Investment Fund can do, uh, lean into a little bit, is picking up on those um, opportunities to actually reward producers for those co-benefits as well. So rather than additionality being purely linked to, for example, carbon, if you've already increased your carbon historically because of what you've been doing and you're sort of potentially running out of room to move, um, actually getting the additional recognition 
for things like the biodiversity or the social or the cultural benefits that you're actually developing. And I know there's a lot of work around this natural capital space that others have been um, doing recently. And I know that conversation around additionality just keeps coming up because you're absolutely right. It shouldn't be your producers who have led the way, um, who are left, I guess, almost disenfranchised by the system. And unfortunately, in quite a few examples, that is exactly um, what has happened. So there are, there are no silver bullets to that one. I think the other point that I would point, that I would make as well though, is that we've got multiple elements of this proposal. So Pete, you know, for example, you may not, you, while the additionality component is still being negotiated around biodiversity, carbon, et cetera, there's other avenues under this proposal. So whether that is climate ready business leadership development, where farmers are able to take those next steps and move towards carbon neutrality or whatever it is that they decide to go down. Um, there's also the energy component and then there is the resilience network. So it's not necessarily hard cash in your pocket, but it's making sure that there is still a place for those first movers to actually be able to be rewarded um, under this kind of proposal. Excellent. Great answer. Thank you, Verity. Uh, we're going really well with time. Is there any other questions or comments that people would like to throw in now before we would move on to the next part of the agenda? I think we're all good. There are a couple of comments, some more commentary like um, messages in the chat room. Um, but I think we have now exhausted our questions for now. Um, suffice to say that we see this as a, uh, a really important part of kickstarting the conversations that we will continue to have as we um, move to really uh, take regional horizons to the next stage of its life cycle and identify opportunities coming out of that um, to pull it apart and to look at, at things that apply uh, for, for you as uh, potential partnering opportunities or providing a, a, a collaborative um, push towards seeing some of these things come to life and, and continue to be developed and then implemented. Uh, so as uh, you can see, I've got my email address there, would love to hear from you and continue the discussions. Um, next, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Cam Close, our uh, campaigns director who would like to just uh, detail some of the next steps in terms of the, the campaigning and the in engagement with uh, Regional Horizons that you may be interested in hearing about um, and learning from Cam in terms of the vision we have for that. So over to you, Cam. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I've just unmuted myself. I have just posted into the chat um, what, what we call the Regional Horizons Engagement Toolkit. And I'm just going to talk through a little bit about this toolkit and acknowledging that for many of you on the call who are in ag bodies and in other organisations, this may not be as relevant for you. And um, Wendy and Verity will be in touch um, to, talk, to talk you through a little bit about our strategy with uh, engaging in the sector. But this is specifically for farmers and members of FCA who really want to um, make, make the stimulus program reality because as Wendy just said and as Helen said at the start of the meeting this is starting a conversation and this is this is a political document and now we have to make the case to the government and to people in politics to make this to make this stimulus program a reality and um, we know we're just at the beginning of the COVID recovery and we've got a little while to go and I reckon we actually have these asks are very achievable They've been designed to be achievable and I think we have a really good chance to to get a lot of these asks realized but we have to do the work and we're starting to do the work now so we have um, arranged some meetings with MPs and working to try and get a meeting with Minister Littleproud the agriculture minister to get this on his agenda but while this is happening it would be really powerful if we could have uh, farmers and supporters out in the field organizing meetings with their MPs, and if not organizing meetings with MPs, at least getting in touch with them, either writing to their offices or calling up the offices and getting regional horizons on their agenda. Um, that's, that's the most powerful thing that we can do at this point is make sure that people know that these asks are out there and that there's community appetite for it. Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but polling 
shows that farmers are some of the most trusted spokespeople on uh, climate change. So having a whole lot of farmers and people in the agricultural industry advocating for uh, this, this ag stimulus with a climate perspective is really, really powerful. So as Helen said at the beginning, she'll be advocating for it and talking to MPs about why it's really important, but it can't just stop there and it can't just stop with us. We really need people out in the field, um, out in the field doing, doing what they can to try and get this on the agenda. So if you have a look at the Regional Horizons uh, Engagement Toolkit, you'll see that we've walked through uh, just really basic steps on how to contact your MP, how to get in touch with them, if you have a meeting, um, you know, how to plan for that meeting, how to arrange it, and then when, you, when you're in that meeting, what to do and also, and also what not to do so that you make a really good impression so that we can make sure that this, this document is something that people from across the political spectrum because it requires MPs from over politics, not just from the opposition or not just from the government, to really back it to make sure that we have a chance to get it, uh, to get these asks uh, implemented and money behind them. So the so one side of it obviously is the MP engagement, but there's also uh, building broader advocacy for it, and that's that's a bit of a media strategy. So a lot of you probably have a local newspaper still, hopefully, um, admittedly less around. But if you have a local newspaper, it'd be great if you could write a letter to the editor, outlining you know why why a stimulus program like this is really important, and we've got uh, in this toolkit. We've got some, some tips for how to write a letter to the editor as well. And if, if you're interested and would like to go further, would love it if you could write an opinion piece for either for your local newspaper or if we might pitch it more broadly. And for that to be the case, I'll put my email along with Wendy's um, in the chat. And if you could get in touch, that would be really great because the more media spokes we have, the more powerful this is and the broader we can get our message out there. And just, just I know we're running out of time, but just a, another thing you can do is we have, uh, I'm a farmer for climate action yard signs. They're core flute signs. And we're, we're distributing those at the moment. That's also another really powerful way of showing that farmers across the country and also allies in uh, the urban centers really care about climate change. So if you're interested in getting one of these signs, um, let us know after this meeting and we will, uh, we can send one out to you. So I think that's I think that's about all for me. Acknowledging the meeting's about to end, but if you have any other questions, feel free to get in touch with me. I'll put my email address in here, and also Wendy as well. Thank you, Cam. Um, let's keep chatting. Um, Thank you all so much. Uh, I think we can finish ahead of time, which I know we all have busy schedules, and that will be wonderful to be able to do. Um, so. Uh, thank you, Joe, for that comment <laughs> and everyone else. I would bid you uh, farewell for now. Thank you all again so much. Thank you for the team. Thank you to Helen. Thank you to Verity and uh, Cam and also for the wonderful questions and the attendance and the interest and the support of Regional Horizons and Farmers for Climate Action. Um, hopefully we'll speak to you soon. Goodbye all.